As to tonight, while we were discussing the publicity material for this event, Dr. Hoffman jokingly noted that uh, scientific achievements don't do him much good in the world of poetry. And despite the humor behind his comment, I could understand how such connections might become tiresome. Even the blurbs on his book jackets highlight the link, as in George and Ava Klein's assessment, that Royald Hoffman remains a scientist in his poetry, and he is a poet when he teaches science. It's a good tagline, but as with most sound bites, I wonder if it obscures as much as highlights the truth. Clearly, Dr. Hoffman remains interested in science, even in his guise as poet and dramatist. His poems frequently deploy a scientific lexicon in lyrical fashion, highlighting the eloquence of chemistry as a mere form of linguistic expression. And perhaps more pointedly, his work seeks to yoke the pursuits of the scientist with concerns of the everyday, as in the poem Tsunami, where a meditation on solitons becomes a pie to a woman into whose eyes the speaker would sink willingly. Or the poem Quantum Mechanics, which sees the path of science ending like a love in a world demonstrably false, in the vacuum its place filled by the new. Nonetheless, to see Royald Hoffman exclusively, or even principally, as a poet of science is to miss the myriad and nimble projects of his verse. His subjects range across history, literature, visual art, and music. Moreover, the way these align alongside the kinds of quotidian events and experiences that have fascinated poets for millennia. Within his writing, many of my favorite pieces have little overt connection to science. Some of these poems tackle large subjects, as in Two Fathers, which recounts the heroic death of the speaker's father during the Holocaust and later his relation to his stepfather. Others are smaller. The wry humor of terrorists, in which the relations of a married couple are likened to being stalked by a house cat in the dark. The satire on totalitarianism in Svolok, where two Russian airport guards must decide which books to confiscate from a piece of luggage. Or even opening a drawer, a love poem refracted through the speaker's inability to fold his own shirts. Royal Hoffman is not, as some would have it, either a scientist or a poet, or even both, or at different times, different things. Rather, his is some liminal identity amid them all, holding each in suspension. In the introduction to his book, The Same and Not the Same, Dr. Hoffman defines chemistry as a science whose facts and processes are always in precarious balance between polar extremes. The polarities of substances and their transformations, he writes, resonate with forces deep within our psyche. To be a scholar of chemistry is to inhabit a middle ground between these extremes, to witness their tensions and, in such witness, to understand how tension gives life in its potential for change. The metaphor works for the man as well. In an NPR essay on the tense middle, he describes his distrust for stasis, preferring a life ever poised to evolve. Extreme positions, he acknowledges, are impractical, unnatural, boring, the refuge of people who never want to change. In another age, we might have rightly identified Dr. Hoffman as a Renaissance man, but in an era marked by increasing specialization, I'm not sure the term has the same resonance it once did. That's unfortunate, especially given our presence on a campus dedicated to the proposition of a liberal arts education. Despite our rhetorical homage to a general intellectualism, I fear we don't always mean it. Like my students, I sometimes slip into seeing academic requirements as simply that, command performances, the English course that the business student must submit to, the biology class feared by the theater major. Royal Hoffman turns such static identities on their head, reminding us how various endeavors of the mind not only can, but should inform one another as well. In a world where so many of us struggle with a solitary skill set, he is master of many precisely because he does not see ideas in isolation, but as part of an intellectual chorus whose song is undeniably stronger than any single voice. 
Roald Hoffman is presently Frank H.T. Rhodes Professor Emeritus of Humane Letters at Cornell University, where he has taught since 1965. He has published five collections of poetry, as well as three plays, one of which, Something That Belongs to You, had a staged reading at the Maudlin Center in 2009. He has authored a number of books about chemistry for the general public and is the presenter of the PBS World of Chemistry video series. Since the spring of 2001, he has been the host of a series at New York City's Cornelia Street Cafe called Entertaining Science, which explores the juncture between performance, art, and science. And incidentally, in 1981, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Not bad for a poet. We're thrilled to have him with us tonight. Please help me welcome Royal Hoffman. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction, David. Um, I hope the chemists in the audience are taking notes on what makes a good introduction. <laughs> so they live up to that. I'm glad to be here, uh, and in part you have taken away some of my work about um, getting the science out of the way. I'll still do it, but maybe with less effort, uh, in because it's the first thing that comes to people's minds when they uh, hear me read. Um, about putting chemists and poets together, it's interesting that uh, I, I found two quotations from Alexander Pope uh, that about that. and. Uh, Alexander Pope was also um, the end in English letters of when science and poetry worked, walked hand in hand. So Pope could write about these, and so could Coleridge. Uh, Coleridge went in search of metaphors, when in want of metaphors he went to his friend, uh, to his um, friend Humphrey Davy to see some demonstrations. After that, poetry and science sadly parted company in English and in other literatures too. Anyway, here's Alexander Pope's uh, Pope writing. Uh, see the blind beggar dance, the cripple sing, the sot a hero, lunatic a king. The starving chemist in his golden views supremely blessed, the poet in his muse. In another place he writes, hence the fool's paradise, the statesman's scheme. Incidentally, if you want a title for your next book, Pope is a good place to look. There have been hundreds of titles from these lines. Hence the fool's paradise, the statesman's scheme, the air-built castle and the golden dream, the maid's romantic wish, the chemist's flame, and poet's vision of eternal fame. So they're both equally deluded, the alchemist and the poet. So we're joined together in this. Um, now, let me talk a little bit. Uh, I don't want to talk really about science and poetry, but I'll read you a poem where the language of science um, is uh, comes is connected to the language of poetry, but they're still kept separate. Um, so the story behind this is that um, Carlos Fuentes, the great Mexican writer, was giving some lectures at Cornell about Mexican literature for a semester. We became friends, and uh, uh, he one lecture told the story of Sor Juana, a Mexican nun, who at the end of the 17th century uh, wrote poetry and had to enter a convent to do that. Um, and uh, the same week I heard a lecture about cell membranes and uh, that the membranes were necessary or various organelles in a cell. And somehow I put these together so let me uh, in let me read that poem. It's called Coral, the Spanish word for enclosure. One, to grow animal smart, the membranes of eukaryotic cells rim twice the coded library of the nucleus, 
tangled and fused to the gaudy network of sacs of the endoplasmic reticulum, pinched off subcellular organelles and power cells with the know-how to reject a transplant, wrap a myelin sheath around a neuron, see red and then see yellow. Still better microscopes make out more partitions in the emerging inner texture Freedom to change is built from lipid tailored confinements, warm prisons where enzyme brews gel. Ways in and out are ingenious. Shaped pores, embrasures, and this chemical escalator called active transport. Fluid, mosaic, the membranes hold sequestering works. Two. In 1655, Juana Inés de Asbaje begged her mother to dress her as a boy so that she could study at the University of Mexico. At the court of the Viceroy, she astounded 40 professors with her mathematics and Latin odes, but it was not a time for learned women in Mexico, so Juana entered the convent of San Jerónimo, within watched two girls spinning atop and from what she called her black inclination for wisdom had flowers sprinkled, so that as the top danced out its loss of momentum, one might see its spiral trace and not a circle. Juana mixed earths and in a library of 4,000 volumes wrote theology and love poems, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, shutting herself in the cell where knowing is permitted. So they're separate, um, but I saw something similar between those two parts of my life. Uh, could I bring them together in some way? The first part of the poem illustrates that uh, the very language of science has all these neat words, which mean sometimes uh, very specific meanings, but they are nice sounding. I mean, a word like eukaryotic, it's very hard to do better than eukaryotic. Um, uh, but uh, it also illustrates one of the problems that I have when I use those words in a poem. And that is that this is the, uh, when you read a poem, or when you hear a poem, you don't always understand every word in that poem. Or you don't understand even the meaning especially in contemporary American poetry with the self figures very strongly. You may not share that experience. It's probably a bad poem if you can't share that experience in some part. But uh, you don't understand something, but you're forgiving because we float on the sound of the words to the next piece where meaning makes its place. Now, if there are too many disconnections of the audience from the meaning, you will go to sleep, but if there are, if but you are forgiving. You don't have to understand everything when you hear a poem. The problem with science is, is that for most Americans, let's blame a teacher for it. Somewhere in grade school, someone told you this is science. You're supposed to understand this, and if you don't understand this, you're stupid. Okay, that's a very heavy burden to bear. To bear. If, if I want someone to also float on the sound of the words until the next piece of meaning comes in. Let me uh, read one of the other poems that was mentioned here uh, by David when he introduced me, and that was the soliton uh, idea which is described in this poem. So a soliton is a solitary wave, and a tsunami is one example of it. And unlike regular waves, which while they can do damage near shore, but in the middle of the ocean, you just bob an up and down as a wave goes uh, through you. Uh, but uh, solitons carry a lot more energy and are different kinds of waves. 
uh, but they have this incredible property, these waves that carry energy, is you think that like arrows, when, when two solitons collide or one catches up with another one, there's gonna be mayhem, but they just pass through each other untouched. And this is very hard to believe, but if you go to YouTube, the current source of wisdom, you can, you can, see, um, you can see pictures of that happening with solitary waves. Tsunami. A soliton is a singularity of wave motion, an edge traveling just that way. We saw one once filmed moving heedlessly across a platinum surface. Solitons pass through each other unperturbed. You are a wave not standing nor traveling, satisfying no equation. You are a wave which will not be Fourier analyzed. You are a wave in your eyes I sink willingly. Not solitons, we can't pass through unaltered. Now I'd like to read a group of poems. So now I'm done with the science. No more science, unless it comes in naturally. Um, it will come in, in various ways, but here is a few poems from a special place, which was an artist colony started by another chemist, Carl Gerasi, and it has, uh, and uh, it is very far from either Ithaca or Richmond. It is in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, over the, six miles from the sea, uh, over the hill from Stanford, a beautiful, rather different kind of countryside. And here's one poem that came from that. Here's what the wind will do. Sweep up the gully as airy serpents of tall grass. Elsewhere, steady but shifting, bend, thistle cl uh, bend thistles into treble clefts and ampersands, or rampant fell a redwood pulling its roots an oak span into the air, even remind me of you blowing across my sweaty belly. Okay, so there were these thistles. These were, there were hills yellowing, um, there were cattle grazing on the hills, and there were these thistles along a path, and the thistles looked like that. So I used them to make this poem. The next day, and I thought that it was the rain that had beaten them down, and then they came up. There were very strong rains sometimes. Next day, someone told me it wasn't the rain, it was herbicide. Which the thistles weren't good for the cattle, and so they wanted to get rid of them. So there was, there was the romantic, my romantic feeling about the thistles, gone away, lost. But meanwhile, I had this treble clefts and ampersands or. Now, uh, it's pretty hard to get ampersands into a poem. Uh, so I really like that. Uh, so what was I going to do? The, the rationale for the poem had gone away, but I had this phrase, so I wrote another poem. Here is what thistles can do. Spread with a natural vengeance, like a shanty town, like a fire whose blue flames burn through the summer light. In the slow bang of the green world, they create inviolable space, yet serve as a floret feeding niche for hoppers, bumblebees, a spiked perch for hunterflies. I've seen thistles bent by herbicide into treble clefts and ampersands and surmount that elsewhere. I've seen an old thistle sway under a finch, and the other day, one forced me from my path closer to you. So that's a salvage job. Uh, uh, in general, in poetry, I think it's true in science too, you don't let go of a few good words. If you're not gonna use them, then you use them some other, some other place or uh, phrase. Here's one from the same uh, setting. The Bering Bridge. Uh, this refers to the land bridge between Asia and uh, the Americas. The old men say 
the sky was once so close that if you shot an arrow up, it would bounce back at you. The sky swallowed birds. Sometimes it lay like the luxuriating fog just above our tents, and the man could climb to the opening at the top where the smoke went out and talk to the gods. Then the redwoods came, sacrificing all to the main trunk and they jacked up the sky. And then men with balloons and telescopes pushed it back further. So it became difficult to talk to straight to the gods. One had to yell or use the intercession of shamans. Now I have flown myself across the Pacific, seen the deep sky blue at 30,000 feet. They say a man has walked on a moon they say the earth is getting warmer. I see smog, the sky coming back down over California. In that beautiful setting, I started writing some poems about my childhood, um, which was in wartime Europe at a bad time uh, during World War II. And um, I, I had not written about that time in any way until about 20 years ago when I was at this place. And I, I know exactly what stimulated me in one setting there to do that. Uh, and then since that time I've written uh, things on and off. And I want to read you four short poems which deal with that, and some of the poems are from my experience, and some are imagined situations. For instance, the very first one I'm going to read to, to you, which is called The Bond. I was trying to understand the bond that sometimes came up between uh, the people in a concentration camp and the guards on whom everything depended for those people. And so that uh, is from. Um, yeah, I think I have it here. Come, Mr. Gottlieb. You can do it, I know. And I did skin the others for this pink-cheeked German gentleman, for he had good reasons, barbed wire, and he did give me true instruction the word, a manual. And he put in my knife, in my hand, the knife cut from an old ram's horn. Practice on deer, if you like, he said. And there were deer in a fence. And the knife with the old letters carved in the bone slipped through the fat, sticking in just a few places. They taught me well. And he, well dressed, his shoes polished, stood on the side watching, and I knew he'd go on and ask me to skin myself. For him, I could learn even that. And then uh, this one is called Flat Stones uh, Beg to be Recycled. And it mentions a town which is now in the Ukraine where I was born called Zlochov. Flat stones beg to be recycled. We go back, my mother and I, back to Zlochov, where Ukrainian girls in red and black embroidery sing a song, offer us bread and salt. For we are guests in their town, aren't we? But we look down, clement June turns December, snow begins to fall, outline the scratches in the paving stones so they grow into Hebrew letters. We stand in a minefield, my mother has trouble seeing in the snow. And then two newer poems, but with the same setting in a way. One is called The Gaze. My mother says, 
Every day we looked death in the eye. She's proud of her English. Were you scared, Mommy? Yes, and then she smiles, the rare smile of the sick. He looked away. I was there, but a child can't see. I imagine now my mother, her brothers, and Nunya, I in the attic in our long dark evenings, for what if Duke's neighbor saw a light? There, death comes riding into small village noises, death with spats, holster, a whip, breaking branches as he rides, working quietly his way through lists, ridding green earth of a worm in the eye. His roaming stops by Duke's school. Inside they hear hoofbeats that stop. Death spots them across the wall. And they look him in the eye. And then death boots, spurs and all, smells stale cabbage soup, which reminds him of the dead soiling themselves. He looks away fastidious death and comes back the next day. This one is called rat language. And the same word occurs here, which I should have warned you about. There is a word duke, which is the name of the family that uh, hid us out in this attic. Uh, it's a Ukrainian family name. That name recurs in here also. Rat language. There is a woman trapped under a grate she spoke to me calmly, asking for help. We must save her. But move slowly, for she's grown in there, grown to the shape of the sewer. Her bones must be bent. We can't just take her out. Her muscles must be massaged. Before we walked out in June 44, walked from the Duke's to the Russian lines, did they massage the men's legs, the stronger women? They were swollen. There was no place to walk in the storeroom where we hid, the bunker we grew in under it. We must lift her gently with oil poured round her with a winch. There's time. Please talk to her. Ask her to how she came in the sewer, why her children left her. Was there a time she could lift the grate? Ask her what food people threw her way, where her patients came from, and who else lived in the sewers, and did she learn la rat language? Meanwhile, I'll get help. So that is one thing that I write about, um, these poems of a, a much darker time. But now let me shift and read a few poems from um, not in these books, and um, yes, actually these are from my newest book, uh, Solitan. I have some copies of my books to sell, of course. Um, see, my mother, it took 20 years for my mother, who figures in these poems, is no longer alive, uh, but it took her 20 years to get over the fact that I didn't become a real doctor. Okay. And then when I started writing poetry, I got it all over again. She said, they're going to fire you. And what she meant was that chemistry professors don't write poetry and you'll get fired because you do that. Um, and so I want you to prove my mother posthumously wrong that you can make a living by selling poetry books. They cost just the price of three lattes and uh, sell you some. Um, let's see, this is one, Shall You Dance? And no choice. The very idea makes you reach for a tension, casts off collagen's triple strand through ratcheted micromotions into muscle cells, then tendon extension, arm arc, the neck 
your red-brown hair follow through till the air waning all tohu vibohu snaps wise to the line. Afterwards you say, you ask me which muscle hurts. Whatever muscle I move is the one that hurts. Still, when you climb in your breath, you hear life passing out of you. When you dance, music hides the sound. Such taut carving of air by body will start a conflagration, could make time a semi-classical approximation. It's a mixture of the scientific language with the dance there coming in. Here's another one, dream core. These are now on quite varied subjects, uh, as you'll see. Core in the sense of a, a body of people, like Peace Corps. Uh, in my country, if you wake, snatched from the dream half done, you ring the alarm. There's a bell by every bed in my country, and soon there are cars flashing green in the night. Friends come, for they know I would do it for them. Come to help me re-enter the dream. They build the set. I sit, a bridge, killing shadows under it. All these they paint, high steps, a pub, from a truck, they roll out mirrors, chests, dress a boy in Elizabethan street costume, teach him to pour ale. In the half dark, my friends pat each other, practice their lines. They whisper to me, tell us where to stand. Tell us what to say. You are the director, my friends say. It matters to them that I dream, that I dream on in my country. I forgot to say after the poems that refer to the war that I worked some of those poems into that play which had its first reading here, um, which f featured two faculty members that some of you may have had in the theater. The director was Walter Schoen, and Dorothy Holland was the uh, main, played the character who in this very autobiographical play was as effectively my mother. Um, so there is a special connection. But there was also an interesting problem how to work or how to rework poems, which let us say, if they work as poems, will they work in a play? Uh, if, and how, that, that's an interesting problem that I, I dealt with. And I think it came out fine, but I'm prejudiced. Um, Okay, this one is different. It's called, We Will Not Be Moved. Let's see if I can find it. sure I have it with me actually and I don't quite have it memorized so we will let that one go for a while uh, but uh, let me try this one which is called Birdland and for some people does not need to carry a credit to Wallace Stevens. There's a poem he wrote about, so some of you may know, and if you don't, you, you should read it. It's a wonderful 20th century poem. Birdland, it has nine parts. One, a bird is, a bird is not the same bird. To be, a bird must be the bird it is. Sparrow, ortolan, warbler, barn owl, short-toed eagle, Egyptian vulture, tit and wren, magpie. Three, and as it is seen, 
It is. Avert Shaper of clay birds says, people, oh, they think a bird is the same on both sides, but it isn't. Look on this side, the feathers are softly folded back. There, see a dangerous hollow place. Four, a bird crossing fighter contrails vouchsafes flight in man-bird heaven. Five, I, a cedar, six blackbirds. The one many problem is nervously resolved. Six, a bird rising in the dynamical correlation of oak thicket and cloud, what was sundered on the second day is made whole. Seven, the scatter of sparrows works out the space where they were. Eight, a thrush sings out, but it is in a cage, hung on a tree. No, not one, but ten. Oh, how many birds will make a brochette de grieve? And where, hunter, will their breast spots have gone? Nine, one time, just one, a bird, the bird, dives toward me, stretches full into the arrow that lights up its target, the idea of bird in me. Uh, the Wallace Stevens is much, much better. Uh, um, this is, this was, uh, once in a while I find, uh, I found myself writing a religious poem um, and this is one of them. I was, I was in a, actually in the south of France in a retreat I had built myself in Provence, and uh, it was Christmas time, so I decided to find out <coughs> what the story was about. <coughs> Excuse me. And so I read the Gospels about the story. This is called communication problems. They needed each other, and as I wondered why, I imagine he too tried to understand what had come of the stray seed set in the murky tide pool. A time he spoke to them, like one man to another. A few heard, the others ignored him. So he hid his voice in whirlwinds. And then, thinking they'd listen closer to their own, spoke through prophets. When this didn't work, he tried dreams. Oh, they were in want of guidance, these people. Even wise kings had to be told not to go to Herod, and the next moment Joseph to take his small family to Egypt. Still later, he resorted to planting visions in Theresa and Hildegard. Now he despairs, dreams gone to angst, churches in control of visions. He sends signs, but these grown quiet, the sway of a stalk where a grasshopper sat, the tree snail shells, rain still needed for a rainbow. And uh, let me read, I have a few copies of my second book also here, as well as the one I read from. Let me read uh, just three poems from that. And uh, this one, oh, it creates its own settings. It's called Real. Sea mounts below the surface they seem to be. One night you were swimming with strong strokes and they cut you. The salt stung but you kept on, not wanting to show you were afraid of what's under water. Asking quietly around, you find their presence doubted. No one else has seen them. They say it's just a deep sea. No angelfish or coral so deep. You return in the early morning hours when you can't sleep. You're alone, and you swim around, try to define them without touching. You remember how they cut. You think you know where they are. 
You come back again carrying sacks of words, which is all you have, build coffer dams and caissons, encapsulating what's down there, it will be revealed. Words tumble into place, pleasuring others. Here they build a paper mache mold. There the construction is airy, strong, and supple, like a spider's framework silk. Words craft textures round the shapes underneath. You hear their sense in the worlds in your mind. One day it is time for others to see. So you bring them by, tell them of the wine dark sea. Tell them of the, what cuts underneath. You show them the sluices, the storm you've diverted into a glass box. It's a success, a good party. One likes the sheen of the silk curtain. Another admires the caisson airlock and wants to license it. Someone remembers how he was afraid of swimming in the dark, how he once brushed against an eel. They laugh and cry. Some even stay to see you break the gates, strip the curtains, open all the structures to see nothing there. The sea as it was, as it will be. The sea and around you the words rise, only words entwined, composing a trellis on an ark, gulls diving for jellyfish. Yes, now let's see. Grand unification. So this is grand unification. That sounds like science, right? Okay, so you're gonna get it. This is all about string. This is my string theory poem. This is just a rule. Strings that meet, wriggling in their roughened up space time. If their tips just touch, they must merge in bigger lines, loops, necklaces, or thatching self assemble. This is so, but it is not real. It's just a rule. Loops tangle, there is an exchange of quantum numbers. The stray collision sets the strings rotating, rippling a whip, and then the extra snap loses a particle, boson or fermion, and light any color. The math says it must be so. Mind you, this is not people passing, a look that locks on some mist braid of a future. This is not a hummingbird's tie to the sweet and the red tie testing stasis, and it is not the interlace of frost, another season's non-linear history of steam meanders, nor rope dancers. For those you need words, but here just watch the math. Follow it across, or around, or down. Just follow its unhusking to the small world where intuition is strung out as far as it will give. But equations work here as well here as for real billiard balls, whirling dervishes, or galaxies. There is no need for me to say all this. In this small infinite infinities, anomaly slough off the loops vibrate, a keen undulation, clockwise rippling, nothingness in ten dimensions, 26 the other way. This fits, but it's not all. The dimensions must compactify in a silent crumpling, curling in of what there's room for into inwards, innards, the quantum numbers then come out naturally, strung out on a loop that is gravity, the source of all interactions. We are so near understanding everything. I believe reasons without words, classy symmetries, it's a rule, and upscale the sun shines, frost melts, and zingo the strings of my heart. So there is everything you want to know about string theory in there. So that's another problem I have is uh, about science. It's not a real problem. Is um, the trouble is that when I am writing about science, I feel my colleagues looking over my shoulder as I feel obliged to get the science right. So if uh, if there, if I were to write the crystal mercury, and mercury is a liquid and not a crystal, I'm worried that, I, I shouldn't worry because my colleagues aren't reading this stuff. So, but uh, it's, it's put some pressure on me to get it at least approximately right. And that doesn't mean that a poet doesn't feel the same, who is not a scientist doesn't feel the same pressure. Uh, just one more poem from this. 
No, I think we don't have the time, so I'll just read uh, something from um, three poems that I wrote. Uh, I wrote a group of poems uh, just a few years ago, and I went to the Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina. And a wonderful 75-year-old, now almost 80-year-old craft school. And in there, I wrote a series of poems which were inspired by crafts. And the first one is, uh, is one from, I also took, I was there as a writer, but I also tried my hand at all the things because uh, I wanted it. But there was one workshop on making dinner plates, rather specialized. There, was, there were several ceramic workshops. I look at ceramics a lot, and I've written about it. Uh, this, this one is called Strong Feelings About Dinner Plate Decor. It's the curtain, stage set, and if you're hungry, the last thing you'll see. A chance to impress before and after. Yes, an argument for drama, but food is the play. A lot of what makes me hungry tends to brown, like French toast and onion rings. Frying and bacon does it. Not the same fun, not the same being more fun than the same. See God's first week. I'd say stay away from brown. Except for some kids I know, most folks eat from the outside in and don't want to be don't want to wait too long to be pleasured by a pattern. A lighter rim, so that you can spot the, 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 that red beet contemplating a dive onto a white lace tablecloth. Food comes as it gets to be, organic, semi-liquid in slopes and scallops of collapsed mashed potato mounds, pea landslides, gravy congealed in the memory of being ladled out, dressing droplets shaped by surface tension, looks good against a neat but unsymmetrical grid. I don't know about you, but my roast beef, potatoes, and vegetable of the day tends to get messier fork by fork. A camouflage net of beige and green won't make it easy to sop up the last bit. Blue's a safe pattern, bet, for, and not just in sky or jeans. No food is blue. Flowers, small motifs, the calming beat of repetition, a gentle palette. Food is rocking chair, mother and grandfather home. The way to your mouth is not in your face. No worms or snakes. No Roger Bacon sides of beef. For that matter, no frolicking sheep or chickens, especially no calves or suckling pigs. Little fish are okay. We're human, please. No concave surfaces, no knife traps in corrugated terrain. All this said and done, it's not that different from marrying someone. Oh, there's reason, and parents will tell you whom they don't like, while you just go on and find that special one who is like your mother or first wife or not. My mother used to tell me, you sleep where you make your bed and eat from plates, lovely plates, made to break every rule. I think there aren't too many poems. If there's a competition for poems about plate decor, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and here's two more. This is now from a metal shop, a metal workshop. It's called With or Against. From a workaday rusty bar, the saw cuts a cube of steel. Its face shines bright as love, welded in arc and sparks to a rod, in and out of a forge spilling flame. A steel cube is swung to anvil, its yellow red like rose hips in our valley, a woman bracing a chisel, a man swinging sledgehammer, 20 kinds of nerves go to the hand, like the line cut in a block, now cooling, soon to make patterns in another, you mark me. Do we follow the way of steel? 
its impure alloy strength. A master smith said, comply, but contend, make heart soft, hard again, beat blade and girder into rabbit's ear and morel. Love, O oh love for steel too, is built sweet out of strict desire for the you that is not you, you. And this is another one now in glass making. Um, choice. Glass won't think, red orange out of the furnace, its mass wrapped around a pipe, it cools a dark red, fades, revives in the oven, sags a spell. I would be glass giving. The glassmakers control. Into the fire, he says, out. He presses the glass with cork boards, sparks fly, his tongues constrain, glass plunged into water, and ashes crackle, saved. I would be the glassmaker. But who controls whom? Thought gone into feeling in his hands, an arc swung and glass, only glass could, stretches, sets one curved gently nestled into another, near as we were to music. Not too hold, cold, not too hot. Even tempered, annealed, disorder flows, blessing change in life's shape. Soon when we meet, will you, will you be glass maker or glass? And let me finish with two poems, one from the same California setting uh, that I mentioned before, and one from Provence. So there are two rather different parts of the world. Um, A little bit of background for this one. It's called Second Growth, and this had to do with where we were. There were redwood forests, but they were uh, devoid of new trees because they had been cut down in that part. Uh, almost every tree to rebuild San Francisco after the uh, earthquake fires of about just over 100 years ago. So they were second growth redwoods. But in 100 years, a redwood gets to be pretty big. They left the small ones there. So there's a lot of language around this place uh, uh, that goes in and around the cutting of the redwoods. Second growth. Everywhere, redwood stumps. El corte de madera, but not all trees served the live oak and madrone they let be. And when ground shook and San Francisco had to be rebuilt, they cut the sequoia, they cut clear the tree called Semperverance. One hundred year old stumps, still solid. Tough wood, five feet above ground, the fellers cut notches for springboards where they stood with 12 foot saws, teams of oxen, later steam donkeys, their winches straining, waited to pull the logs and skids uphill in the air, cursing, cracking whips and kerosene. Moss on every brown stump, and live oak, lichen on every rock, and the concrete sculpture, ferns, cream bush, and gooseberries grow in the shade. A squirrel leaves neat sections of an acorn on a stump. A fairy ring, second growth, not of mushrooms up through needles, but of now hundred-year-old trees, what clones poking holes in the sky, gently hugging the, the stump. On the ground, the surprising small cones of redwoods echo the reddish-brown of bark and burl, each cone a cathedral of spiky futures. A road is cut out of paradise. Where this one time logging road was widened, clay and loose stone washed down in spring, last year a redwood its roots weakened fell across. Where they cut it, I count 150 rings. This road asks for care in its second growth. The road you and I will travel, 
is one that has been touched by Pacific mist, by people, the cultivated land, the stump cattle crossing, the hip rows, tenants in common, redwood and coyote, a poet, cross paths, flinch and feed, tenants in perpetuity on a blue world, with Adam I and Adam II. The beginning was doubled, bright, stark, inic genuities given to the first Adam and Eve. Tomorrow their brood will find microbes to feed on plastic bottles and caps floating in the North Pacific gyre and elsewhere turn them to roads. Past dominion they will walk hand in hand with the children of those who till and tend of the second Adam needing Eve. Together they build this road a road out of paradise for you and me does not stretch ahead on land alone it flies with a hawk and plunges into every phosphorescent bay and down the dark deep underwater canyons we will walk that road you and i dance down it in life's samba like scuttling crabs people dear people and manzanita and machines aware of the one earth commingling strategies and wisdoms in slow fixes earth healing at our touch and the last one will be actually the last one in this Salatan book and uh, that is set in uh, Provence you can tell that because it has an olive tree in it there aren't any olive trees in, in Northern California, nor in Richmond, but if we don't watch out, there will be. Um, it's called Enough Already. You walk into the sun-splashed olives, mossy trunks, greener than fresh grass. This doesn't seem to be enough, so you think, even here they grow olives only on warm terraces and ask who first found olives had to be cured this cleverness too does not satisfy so walking in hand in hand into the grove you say the world needs us and other lovers to give such life which would do my nicely for most save those who'd leave it for a creator but then, alone, you look real close, and a black spot on a green bark you reach for sharpens into inch and a half of scorpion. You see a red beetle, and by God, that does suffice. Thank you. <laughs>